Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Andrew, if it's possible, give me rights of uh, host one more time. Uh, now, now, uh, yes, it's easy. Yes, it's easy. Uh, so, uh, so now moving uh, to uh, the next speaker, it's Will it's Victor Andrews. Andrews, um, um, for, for a long time, time with, uh, with the government. government. So, Victor, so Victor you, you can, can uh, give uh, a uh, uh, overview, overview of uh, uh, existing, existing economy. Economy. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, sorry. Can you repeat the question because I, I missed the last part? Uh, if you can analyze for us existing uh, recovery economy plans, which uh, we saw from Ukrainian government, uh, so now I will show it to all uh, of us. So you can find of uh, on our government website also English documents. Um, so maybe Institute for Future, your group, and you directly analyze already these documents and also procedure of creating these documents. Why it's not like think tank work, it's more like work near government is... Uh, this model of uh, work effective and what do you think about uh, this uh, about these documents uh, can western partners work directly with them or they still um, draft version of recovery well uh, well i will not uh, waste your time for uh deep analysis of uh, all these kind of documents there are a lot of conferences a lot of uh, analysis of what uh, do the government propose and also andre mentioned also activity of uh, their group who also developed some proposals uh, i'm now in uh, military forces in the army of ukraine and uh, before this uh, i was also involved in creation of the movement dobrobat we are making the real recovery uh, we bring people together to rebuild some villages, cities, and then so on. And in 2015, I was uh, vice of the head of the military administration of Donbass region. And uh, well, I was, was responsible for the whole humanitarian situation in, in that region. So I have a very huge uh, practice of understanding the situation. The problem of all Ukrainian plans is that they do not correlate with the capacity to implement them and uh, this uh, should be uh, taken as a basis when you are dealing with ukraine because uh, uh, you know uh, the, the the plans which are proposed they actually are not very much different from the plans which uh, for example were proposed by the prime minister honcharuk who promised uh, uh, the growth of uh, 40% of gdp uh, by 5 years so, um, you know, it's always about the same story. Uh, this is a plan of uh, uh, desires more than uh, than of uh, actions or steps should be taken. Um, uh, I'm more focused now uh, when I have time. Uh, I study the recovery of the uh, post-war uh, world in Europe. And uh, it's very important issue that there were also different models of that recovery, especially when we go to the uh, model of the Marshall Plan. And um, uh, different states used that money for different purposes. But finally, we had uh, some uh, Germany miracle, economical uh, miracle, and Italy economical miracle. But for example, we didn't uh, have any uh, Britain or uh, France uh, a miracle. Uh, why why it happened so? Uh, because uh, Germany and Italy they uh, did not uh, spend that money just for free for everybody. Uh, or they didn't uh, just uh, pass that money to business or to people. Uh, normally they do this through the uh, special credit politics. Uh, Germans they created the special bank, uh, which uh, gave credits for very small uh, rate and uh, in uh, 10 years most of the companies they uh, uh, well closed all the all the uh, credits they received uh, and this was one of the approaches that they did not started from the buildings 
uh, infrastructure and so on. They started uh, uh, from the uh, money of business uh, and huge enterprises, which actually uh, lack of uh, uh, run out um, were, were run out of the uh, running costs and they could not start uh, production because they uh, after the war they have no uh, resources to start uh, to start uh, again their activity. And um, I I think that this uh, the biggest problem for Ukraine will be the choice of how do we spend the money, uh, and and the wrong approach is just to uh, start to rebuild uh, the cities, to build the roads, to build the infrastructure. Uh, I see this in reality in uh, Irpin, or for example, uh, we rebuild the village close to Chernigiv. It's called Yagidne. Uh, we rebuild uh, apartments for uh, 80 families, but uh, people did not uh, come back uh, because they don't have work. So uh, when you build the new house, you build the cool road, you build the park, you and people finally don't have uh, uh, jobs, then they will not live there. And this is not a question of taxes or of uh, uh, communal... Uh, uh, payments or other things. This is a question of do people can earn money at the place they live or uh, or no. The another biggest problem of any kind of plants uh, proposed today is that it's not uh, correct to do uh, plants before the end of war because uh, the question is not about um, victory but it's a question of model of the victory. What kind of the victory we will have? Because uh, you have to understand, for example, that uh, for the moment, 30% of our territory uh, uh, is polluted with the mine. So uh, it's, it, it's again, it's a big uh, question. For example, should we rebuild uh, Popasna city or Marienka or what will happen to the Bakhmut? Uh, should we bring a lot of money in that cities just to rebuild them? Or uh, it's more easy to build the new cities, for example, in Kherson or Mykolaiv region, or even in Kyiv uh, Oblast uh, region, because uh, uh, the biggest number of investors come here. Or maybe even more, uh, it's to, to build the new industry region in the uh, western part uh, of Ukraine, uh, where a lot of people are, li uh, are living now, and which is close to the European border. So um, uh, this is a, a huge question which cannot be answered. And if you don't have answer to that question, any plan you are, are making is, you know, more of intellectual, uh, uh, just like kind of uh, work than, than to have a connection to reality. Uh, another biggest problem, we, we have a million people involved in army now. Uh, so taking with the families, it can be around three million people. What will happen? What will happen to them when they will come back after the war? And uh, you know, this is not the final, uh, the final number because we have now a huge mobilization, and we need at least uh, two, three hundred thousand new soldiers. Uh, so this also will uh, uh, be a question of the working force. Biggest question for our economy. Uh, how many people will come back after the after the war from the Europe? Uh, how many people will uh, work in the economy from the military service? And 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 also the biggest question is the social burden uh, our uh, state will have to handle after the war. And without answers to this question, all the projects of the recovery looks for me very you know in in uh, like in in the fog. I would not discuss it now. I, I the question which should be discussed now is the question of approaches. For example, I, I see that again we have this discussion about corruption. Uh, I will tell you the truth: the corruption will be after the war, and you will never beat it. You can reduce it, uh, and that's the only what you can achieve. But you will never beat the corruption, and this should be the assumption. Uh, so you have to, you know, in China. They have a huge corruption, but they have no problem with the investors. They don't have problem with the with the money and other things. So the question is not about the corruption. The question is about how the investors can have another warranties uh, uh, that uh, the corruption will not damage their uh, profit. 
And you know, in, in, in many other instruments can be effective. For example, uh, insurance of the investment. And uh, if the Ukrainian state by our uh, by the state money will uh, make that insurance, so finally the state will pay for the corruption. So if the investors suffered from the corruption and state should be repaid the insurance, it would mean that the state made corruption and that then it paid for the corruption. So, you know, you see the, the, there is a lot of another instruments to implement, uh, uh, to bring the investors and, and to start to, to build this. But again, um, the, uh, my message is that today we should uh, discuss more uh, instruments than the concrete plans and the concrete uh, enterprises or concrete objects which should be built. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. What do you think about new entities of rebuilding? Like uh, what entities, because many Western partners don't understand why like every month we have new entities, new structure and ministry. Can you explain a little bit like this situation? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, when I served in Donetsk region, I had a situation which I called the anarchy of donors. Uh, many uh, Western agencies and companies came to the Donetsk, uh, Donetsk region and, and do some activity without any coordination, without uh, any understanding of the problems and so on. And we will have this energy of the recovery plans and the energy of the recovery and agencies. And this also, like, you know, the natural situation. It's happened also in many other countries. Uh, I think that the only way uh, to uh, deal with it is to create the international agency uh, which will uh, redistribute the international aid with the uh, local agency also created by this international agency. Uh, I will explain you a very effective approach. Uh, and actually, if we are going to the European Union, then we should use the instruments of European Union the best instrument of European Union is the structural funds, the special funds, which uh, come inside the country, divide the country on the special regions and act directly on the local place. Uh, I saw uh, the work of this uh, foundation uh, funds in Poland and I was really shocked. Uh, just uh, as an example, one short story. Uh, this fund uh, distribute money which are not operated by the local authorities or the national authorities. This is a direct money by the European Union and the fund is distributing it by uh, its own uh, vision at the local place. For example, uh, I, I was in one village, a very poor one uh, in, in the mountains. Normally they uh, were uh, making some contraband with the wood uh, I'm not uh, this, uh, smuggling with the wood, uh, and uh, they could not uh, cut wood uh, because to the European laws, and so it's like uh, entering for European Union was like the kind of the economic death for them. The fund uh, came to that village, uh, hired spe specialists, and created uh, the new idea for that village. Uh, that everybody uh, in in the village should live like in the middle age. They should wear the middle age uh, clothes. They should uh, pr produce some middle age uh, products. And uh, after that, uh, they brought the festivals of uh, nights and uh, and so on. They created the um, restaurants in uh, like middle age style, uh, and they propose a lot of. Uh, services in this uh, middle age style and the village uh, start to grow uh, start growing by this uh, approach but they have no knowledge to create this plan they have no sp uh, specialist to create this plan all this was funded by the structural fund the same story was uh, about the enterprises when uh, for example the european programs if you uh, if you uh, invest money in the new technology uh, European Union covers you 50% of your investment. So the European Union has huge instruments, effective instruments of bringing the country to the European Union. So I think that the best way is that we will use these instruments for recovery or for the integration anyway, not to invent anything new. 
Um, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, I know that Pablo also with his group working on issues of recovery with uh, uh, Ukrainian businessmen, and he, he, he also have a business. So, Pavel, can you share your ideas about recovery plans and uh, tools which our country have for now? Thank you. Uh, microphone. Sound, please. Okay. Is it normal now? Yes. Yes? Yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I would like to draw attention uh, to more uh, general points uh, to the history of, the in of interaction between Ukraine and the uh, Western institution. Uh, the main question uh, on the topic of the rebuilding of Ukraine is uh, what kind of country we want to see in future. Um, as we saw in Lugano, the Ukrainian ruling class uh, would like to receive money from the West and leave everything as it is. I suppose that the Ukrainian people and uh, our Western partners uh, would like to see Ukraine as a country of uh, liberal democracy, a reliable economic and uh, security partner. Uh, but uh, let's answer the question why Ukraine has not yet become a liberal democracy. Why Ukraine, uh, no, we work with, uh, collaborate with the uh, IMF, EBRD, World Bank, American European donors and institution for 30 years. So why Ukraine still a corrupt autocracy? No, we, we have no separation uh, of branches of power, our people not taking part in governing our country. Uh, it is impossible to recall deputies and officials. Uh, why Ukraine only is $4,000 in GDP per capita? Why we are in uh, 130th place in uh, the Economic Freedom Index or uh, 122nd uh, before war we were in uh, Corruption Perception Index. It's curious situation. Uh, on the one hand, the Western world has developed a huge numbers of indexes, which give Ukraine an accurate diagnosis, a backward corrupt country. On the other hand, uh, the Western world provides uh, financial aid to the our government, but never requires improvement of these indexes in return. Why? We are given the same recipes, the same advices, and uh, that which were given five years ago, 10, 15 years ago, not paying attention to the fact that uh, neither five, 10, nor 15 years ago, these recipes worked. It is as if a uh, sick person was undergoing treatment, and uh, despite the worsening tests, the doctor continued to insist on his method of uh, treatment. Uh, I think the reason is uh, that uh, Western experts believe that uh, in Ukraine there is uh, a sufficient number of uh, normal, earnest officials, prosecutors, judges, and uh, apart from them, there is a corruption that these good bureaucrats are fighting against. Uh, corruption is presented to the West like... Uh, toys on the Christmas tree. And it is enough to shake this uh, Christmas tree and corruption will crumble down. But uh, the problem is that the very essence of our Christmas tree, very essence of our state uh, uh, apparat, the essence of our bureaucracy is uh, corruption. The purpose of the existence of most officials is uh, uh, personal enrichment. And now we see this investigation searches uh, in uh, offices and the apartment on top of officials. We see that uh, people uh, only one aim, people have only one aim, uh, personal enrichment. And uh, for 30 years, uh, there has been a negative selection for officials. And if it is, uh, is not changed, all Western aid, uh, which uh, they want to give us as rebuild uh, Ukraine, will end up in the personal accounts of officials. 
the Ukrainian elites who are in power are not interested in modernizing the country. It is the regime now that favors their personal enrichment. And people who want to carry and modernize cannot get into power and cannot influence the government. Access to the media is monopolized now. YouTube channels and social media could be uh, easily blocked by uh, pro-government forces. Uh, then the question arises, what kind uh, of assistance can be provided by the West to the Ukrainian people so that Ukraine becomes a liberal democracy? After war, we need uh, Western partners' help in holding elections under democratic rules with um, low participation barriers, with equal access to the media, with the protection of YouTube channels and social network accounts. This is the first, uh, I think, condition for providing consistency, the change of elites. The second condition should be the implementation of reforms with a focus of international indexes. The current government declare zero tolerance for corruption, commitment to freedom, but our indexes show a completely different picture. Reform must be reforms must be confirmed by moving up in the indexes. And uh, only after <clears throat> power is overloaded, after the necessary reform has been carried out, economic aid can be provided. From 2014 to 2022, Ukraine received $47 billion in aid and loans. $47 billion. What is the result of using these funds? $4,000 per capita and 130th place in the Economic Freedom Index. The Ukrainian people need to change autocracy to the liberal democracy. And the Ukrainian people need help in establishing justice, the rule of law, and economic freedom here. And uh, this work must be done before the allocation of funds for rebuilding. Um, thank you, <laughs> I'm finished. Thank, thank you, Pablo. You know, it's uh, not so big uh, issue on discussion now, so more it's about economy, but I, I think I think it's, it's really important to show that we have a strong institution and that countries, for example, Litva, Lithuania, Estonia, which uh, fight with corruption and build strong institutions, they originally more successful, even uh, more successful uh, in uh, economic growth for every person. Um, <laughs> Helena, can you introduce also your position from a bank, banker's point of view, yeah, because you directly work with this money, you saw also examples of uh, supporting different uh, projects, uh, for example, projects in uh, green energy sector, uh, projects in some small business development sector, which um, uh, was uh, um, based on international money. For example, when international donors give uh, grants or cheap credits through Ukrainian bank system before war. So uh, how you see uh, this process for now? And really, like if, if you're interested in my point of view, I also explore all these documents which our government present for now. And I um, didn't understand like what they based on because it's like more than fairy tale that real uh, road map. And um, can you please explain us some more your vision uh, from, um, from your personal vision and vision also from your association. And uh, uh, we also will go then to some legal aspects of compensation and uh, we'll move into a uh, second uh, round of our discussion. So, Helena, please, please. Uh, hello to all. Uh, my introduction for, by Katya was uh, not full. Uh, I am uh, the president of uh, a Global Payment Association and vice president of uh, Ukrainian bank, uh, Banks Association and uh, head of uh, supervisory board uh, of uh, international payment system, Leo, uh, 
and uh, member of uh, supervisory board uh, of uh, non pension non government pension uh, fund Vzema uh, Pomoga was founded uh, by Media Holding Liga. Uh, and uh, what about topic? <laughs> uh, the thesis that I uh, uh, tirelessly convey uh, to uh, foreign uh, audiences and uh, want to convey now, uh, do not wait for the end of the war. Uh, Ukraine needs to recover uh, already. Now, today, here, um, we have uh, already proven that we are unique, uh, stable, are uh, working despite uh, despite everything. Uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, I think Ukraine will go down in history as a country uh, with a unique banking and uh, payment system uh, that fully functions in conditions of full-scale war. Uh, however, uh, of course, we have uh, problematic moments and uh, the international community can help solve uh, these problematic points. Uh, for example, uh, today, despite the large-scale war and all the risks, uh, banks have not stopped uh, lending. Uh, the first period, uh, we had a pause. Uh, banks focused more um, on credit holidays, uh, on uh, restructuring. Uh, restruct <laughs> Um, sorry, uh, restructuring. Restructuring, uh, it is restructuring, uh, so it is a very difficult word for me. <laughs> uh, then very quickly, we cautiously began to increase uh, um, uh, increase lending to business. Uh, and now, and today we see the steps uh, um of most banks uh, to intensify lending in the consumer segment as well uh, however since the discount rate is uh, very high 25 percent now uh, most of the loans are provided under 579 uh, prefer preferential program uh, which is uh, subsidized by the state. Uh, we are very intensive uh, in lending uh, to farmers for planting and uh, uh, harvesting. Uh, banks have issued uh, almost uh, 2 billion euros uh, in loans. Uh, however, the possibilities of the budget of Ukraine today are extremely limited. Uh, therefore, uh, it is impossible to ensure a uh, sufficient level of support uh, at the expense of, of only, uh, only internal uh, resources. Therefore, the active particip participation of Ukrainians' uh, international uh, financial partners in the uh, financing uh, of similar programs is necessary. Uh, with uh, uh, the help of uh, targeted grants um, or through other mechanisms for the distrib distribution of funds, mm. In addition, it is worth investing uh, in Ukraine purely uh, for the pragmatic reasons uh, of foreign investors. Uh, it is still uh, possible to conduct and develop, uh, develop business in Ukraine today. Uh, most of territory of Ukraine um, is far enough from the front and uh, also it can suffer uh, from periodic missile attacks and uh, uh, and other uh, instead uh, an investors uh, um, 
who is able to calculate the risk and um, enter the market in conditions of uh, currently low competition uh, will have uh, the best prospects uh, at the state of uh, economic recovery in the post-war period. Uh, in particular, multiplied uh, capitalization of the investment made. Uh, of course, of course, we would like uh, foreign investors to take an example fr from the courage and bravery of Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians who, despite the war, uh, continue to live and invest. Uh, maybe it is all. Uh, I, I think... Uh, 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 investors uh, um, should be brave like Ukraine and welcome to invest. Yeah, some some of them is, and uh, really even here in DC, it's a more area which famous uh, about creating regulatory policy, of course, but not about like investment. But even here, uh, many companies uh, like development companies, energy companies. Uh, mining companies, uh, I mean, resource mining, they're interested in uh, working with Ukraine, but uh, I, from my perspective of more than 10 meetings with them and more than 30 meetings with uh, uh, legislative uh, creators, um, I see one main point, and it's also will be question for Anatoly. They don't understand now decision making process in Ukraine. So all these entities don't understand like how decision making uh, process work now. So is it administration of president? Is it more government work? Uh, what's the strategy of parliament work? Uh, how in practice uh, this cooperation between European Union and the European Commission works? So Anatoly, if you can represent to us also more understanding of uh, decision making process in Ukraine function of new organs, for example, this investment uh, and rebuilding um, entity, new investment and rebuilding entity, uh, and also a vision of legal compensations for now, it will be very useful for our discussion today and for our discussions for future. Thank you. Yeah, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing uh, this uh, event. First of all, I would like to show you the cat who survived occupation near Bucha. There are many of them, but it is this one is in the house now, inside. So uh, we were here almost for one month. Uh, fortunately, our Every village... event this cat will be, or this dog will be more popular than uh, just discussion, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on the topic, uh, I will start from international uh, perspectives and existing and potential mechanisms of compensation for the damages caused by the Russian aggression. And then I will answer your question regarding Ukrainian stance and uh, how uh, the legislation developments move uh, forward here and what's what's going on, what's happening. So a uh, few words about me. Currently, I'm partner with the international uh, law firm who mostly represents uh, clients worldwide, worldwide in arbitrations and European Court on Human Rights and other institutions. And as a human rights activist, I, I have accompanied more than uh, 50 cases uh, in front of the European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, on behalf of uh, victims of uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine. So uh, my first point is that, uh, unfortunately, currently, uh, there is no solid uh, and effective legal, legal mechanisms internationally which would allow to bring to criminal or any other kind of liability uh, highest Russian elite, military elite, political uh, elite, uh, um, or investigate uh, the crime of uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. And I will not waste your time. You know about this, that uh, International Criminal Court doesn't have jurisdiction over the fact of Russian aggression against Ukraine because neither Russia nor Ukraine have uh, ratified the, the Rome Statute and there are now many conversation, conversations about creating uh, special 
international uh, tribunal which would uh, consider on the merits the fact of uh, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine and subsequently the effects of war crimes uh, committed in Ukraine. Because we must uh, distinguish and differentiate very clearly. It's not many, unfortunately, not even many politicians understand that, that these are different things. The, the fact of Russian aggression against Ukraine is in itself a crime. So the fact that they invaded country uh, against uh, the the statute of uh, united nations against the basic principles of international law it, this fact itself constitutes a crime regardless of what they have done further and all further actions constitute separate war crimes so these are two different uh, issues which should be handled separately and now, as, I, as I've said, there is no institution internationally which would uh, handle and uh, would be um, would have competence to consider these issues on the merits. And regarding special tribunal, uh, like it was for Yugoslavia, for example, I am also a bit skeptical because there are many conversations, but uh, international law is complicated and... Uh, Everyone is cautious. You see this approach when decisions are taken to give uh, weapons to Ukraine. Everyone, like everyone, supports Ukraine, but meantime, everyone is very cautious because, like, not to trigger Russian even more, not to cause like third world war, not to cause uh, a nuclear war. So um, that is why, uh, like, regarding an international uh, criminal tribunal, the most realistically it can be created. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, and um, it will be agenda for the extraordinary summit of the Council of Europe, which is scheduled for 16th uh, of May in Reykjavik. So we will see, but as I say, I'm a bit skeptical. Another way to bring Russia to responsibility also, uh, you know, to exclude it uh, from the, as, to exclude it as a permanent member of uh, Security Council of the United Nations, my, my uh, not only mine, but many practitioners and scholars they agree that architecture security architecture which exists in the world and in europe is outdated it was created after world war ii uh, uh, these mechanisms were created as a response to the atrocities which humanity faced during world war ii but there was presumption that like that every uh, permanent member state and all other countries would act in a civilized way. Like no one could think and predict that such, uh, again, this uh, similar war can occur and happen in Europe. And Russia has proved that it is not a civilized state and it was uh, included as a permanent member of Security Council only because it's alleged contribution to, to win a, uh, like, uh, uh, to, to, to fight the Nazi uh, Germany, but uh, this contribution was also exaggerated, as we know, because Russia at the time was hugely supported by different countries with uh, also weapons, with uh, products, and there was uh, the whole propaganda and ideology of the further Russian state was created as, like, we are the, the biggest uh, uh, winners of Nazi Germany. That's why they were granted like almost for nothing this status internationally but now they must lose they must lose this status okay it's like uh, these are theoretical points but more what is my view because we're here to to suggest something and not to discuss theory and international law it, it's it will take uh, long and it will not be useful so uh, my uh, the most important point i want to raise in this discussion and i see the approach i see the practical way how to create legal mechanisms uh, to uh, to confiscate Russian assets worldwide and uh, use them to, to pay for the damages caused in Ukraine. So starting point is um, 25th of January this year. What happened? The European Court of Human Rights uh, has ruled, uh, has found admissible uh, the, the case, uh, the, the claim of Netherlands and Ukraine versus Russia it is the case concerning downing of Boeing uh, MH17. You know this case. Uh, I will send reference to the case number in the chat. But why is it important? Uh, what, what it means? It means that European Court of Human Rights 
uh, has officially uh, found and established that Russian jurisdiction spreads uh, over uh, Ukrainian non-controlled territories, so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People Republics, from 2014. Not, not from, uh, from the point of a full-scale scale invasion of uh, which happened last year, but from 2014. It means that every business uh, company or, or individual who, uh, whose assets are, were destroyed since 2014 has legal precedent that Russia is uh, not, not guilty yet because there is no final decision in this case. But uh, the fact that uh, the, the court has found that Russia had effective control over this territory means that Russian jurisdiction spread over this territory. So what we, we should do now, we take this uh, court decision, this decision of the European Court of Human Rights, and we go to different countries. We make pressure through public opinion and we make different countries where Russian assets are based. It's almost every country of the world. And we force them to take national legislation at their own level, which would allow to confiscate, to freeze and confiscate Russian assets, which will further be used to uh, compensate the damages for the victims in Ukraine. It's like uh, you, Katerina, uh, have researched on this point. It's like U.S. did uh, uh, regarding Iran. This this precedents they exist in the world, and U.S. Uh, United States can be one of the countries which will give example. But United States is not enough as a country to uh, implement this legislation. We should and push, Saudi uh, Arabia also uh, legislation about Saudi Arabia about uh, 9/11 the same case. Yeah, we mm -hmm. should push France. We should push other countries. It's not that difficult. I mean, from the legal standpoint, because we have already precedent. It's not like theoretical talks. Is Russia guilty? Does it have jurisdiction or not? International law, uh, different uh, complicated issues with special tribunals. We don't need that. We have already precedent. And uh, why European and other countries are also important in this process, because uh, during summer, I will give you specific and very clear examples. Uh, there was not a lot of legal work during summer, and I wanted to contribute to somehow as a professional. So I worked as a fixer for, for French, German, British journalist. I, I also speak French. And uh, uh, so there are very strong uh, investigation uh, journalists who are who are joined and combined in teams who have uh, revealed uh, Russian assets uh, belonging to uh, Russian oligarchs in France, uh, in, uh, in other countries. These are yachts, uh, bank accounts registered on proxies and other names, uh, luxury uh, real estate. And um, there are also, you know, different task forces, uh, for example, na national agency for preventing corruption in Ukraine has united its efforts with uh, Radio Free Europe journalists, uh, Schema, which are uh, financed by US. And they have uh, discovered, they have also completed uh, like extraordinary job. They have found, they have access to uh, serious resources, uh, even not public resources, and they have found a lot of assets. But what is unfortunate that what these countries do, okay, France is informed by us, by our task forces, by investigation jo uh, journalists that we have found yacht which belongs to this guy. And he's not just ordinary Russian citizens. We are not just chasing people who are, we presume that they are, they are innocent and they don't uh, support Putin. But we follow guys uh, against whom we have proof that they have supported, supported Putin regime. They have in such a way contributed and allowed this aggressive war. And we found their assets. We have the proof that they were uh, involved politically in administration in Russian uh, um, Federation. And what can uh, France, for example, do in this case? Yes, they freeze the asset, whatever it is, yacht or bank account. And then after this, they, they say, okay, give us court decision, court verdict, allowing to confiscate this asset because after six months or whatever, according to national legislation of different states, it, it varies. After six months, we are obliged to, to unblock uh, this asset. It will not be frozen anymore. 
because there is presumption of innocence, there are also other international principles, and it's unfortunate because journalists and other guys have, have done so such a tremendous work, but these assets then are unfrozen and re-registered and hidden on other names and sold by this oligarch. So what we need, we need uh, the European countries to take, and other world countries to take special legislation, which would allow to further confiscate this, these assets after they are being frozen. And actually, I have in my mind uh, the, the roadmap, I have a legal framework based on international law. It's not only like some, some ambitions of mine as a Ukrainian, because I want these victims to get compensations. It's, it's, uh, I have done more profound research on this, and I think this is realistic. It's, if, if speaking briefly, not to, to take a lot of time, I, I will share the, the framework, the, the, the view, the strategy, how I see it. I will share with you uh, the, the legal basis for this, including the, the mentioned uh, decision of the European Court on Human Rights, which, uh, uh, which has established uh, Russian uh, jurisdiction over this conflict and over the territories where the most damages uh, have occurred. Thank you. Maybe you have questions. I will, I will gladly an answer them. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so now I propose in this discussion go to final notes and what we, so my uh, understanding of today's discussion, uh, the next note that, uh, um, of course, um, now we have some counting of losers, which was presented by Kiev School of Economics and by our government. Um, and uh, but this loses it's also um like our orientation like uh, estimate uh, of damages but it's not directly loses which was under audit so it's important to understand because for lawsuits it must be of course uh like a more detailed audit and methodology uh secondly like if i understand right your position that uh, lugana plans and our government plan for now it's more about our maximum asking you know when you want to have something ask for maximum or i understand not right please uh, also give this perspective in final notes um third it's that we have multiply organs who work on reconstruction on plants but sometimes they double their functions and i want to in final discussion also maybe give some examples like, like direct examples um, it's it's very important. First, that we must firstly build institutions and uh, li really liberal democracy and fight corruption. Obviously, I think it's all people uh, will uh, said that. And uh, um, also, next point that in recovery plan must be involved like more business and business association because otherwise uh, all the sector people don't come back to Ukraine. Even it will be nice road, but it will be not work as Victor mentioned. So um, final points, it's like open microphone. So who wants please first uh, start. And yeah, and I ask you also to give some direct examples if, if you mention something about compensations or about government work, can you give some direct example of solution to give to our partners, like, you no, know, some direct examples, how it works or not works? Because we also have anti-corruption system now, uh, why it's not works, because it's like independent um, concourse, independent uh, like procedure for these or organs why why it still don't works so it's 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 interesting question please anatoly you mentioned then uh, please write to chat who also wanted to take a vote thank you yeah briefly i i wanted to add on the audit results and yes i know about the overall estimation of damages uh, which were caused to ukraine this estimation is important because we are talking about big numbers like hundreds of billions of dollars. And these numbers, as you say, Katerina, are important to push uh, Western countries 
to take more fast and radical decisions uh, to create uh, legal mechanisms on compensation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, because when when they hear these numbers, they are impressed. But regarding the legal approach, we don't need the overall estimation of damages. We need because each specific case will be considered separately. It's the basic principle of any legislation. So how how we did with the European Court of Human Rights, we took, for example, there was like a big uh, car trading company. Uh, my client, we represented them in the European Court of Human Rights. We just took uh, the the audit report, the evaluation, which was made individually regarding the losses in, in incurred by their business. So and in each case, uh, we, we take separate evaluation and we, we move forward forward just for legal solution we don't need the overall estimation it's uh, regarding this point regarding uh, mechanisms uh, and ukraine and participation i think that real mechanisms allowing to confiscate russian assets worldwide and use them to compensate damages uh, uh, which were caused to ukraine uh, should be not created in ukraine so these mechanisms will be international internationally created not in ukraine so what should ukraine do as a state is provide uh, as you say uh, transparency provide uh, uh, mechanisms allowing to uh, allowing our western partners to finally see and believe that we are moving towards a democratic state we are fighting corruptions and that these funds which will be directed directed here will just not be stolen so we we have to contribute and to provide the utmost uh, cooperation like it was with uh, yugoslavia and other countries so what all all they did was to provide uh, full cooperation for for the international like investigation officers to, to collect evidence, to collect proof. That's what Ukraine should do. It should not harm. It's it's the minimum what, what Ukraine should do. It should not disrupt its reputation worldwide. And other things must be done internationally, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Landa, maybe uh, you can something to add about that because you obviously analyze these procedures for now and these plans. I think it's also will be not fair to say that like this work is nothing because it's 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 also work which our government do and it's uh, vectors analysis, understanding of decision making process, but um, other speakers said that it's only narratives. So what what you think about that and your experts of Forbes? Um... As far as so we don't have a final uh, a final list of uh, what we can have for, to get these uh, compensations and so on. Uh, so uh, on current uh, time, the best way is to get any evidences of. Uh, uh R russian back to losses which we can do we, it may be uh just a, any types of documents in, including photo video and uh, uh like uh police uh, uh, uh judgments uh, from or all we can do uh we do not know exactly what will be in use uh, when the final document uh, uh, will be uh, released so now we just have some to do this maybe more complicated than it should be to get the best result. Yeah, thank you. But what also like business do think about that? Because I know that uh, now many business was like relocated to Europe. And uh, I also wrote article for Wilson Center about this like... Uh, uh, migration of money and migration of uh, creative people because it's it's really eight million people and people who go abroad it's also you know, like active active people and active age so it's economy active people and if war will be like how here in DC said like two three uh, years more so these people will adapt in other countries and they uh 
can't go back to Ukraine. And it's global economy uh, problem because uh, before war, we have this balance that uh, people on retirement, handicapped people, child. Uh, uh, so it's like one worked uh, person for free person on retirement. And if all these people don't come back to Ukraine, we lose just creative potential of, of, of Ukraine. And I didn't see any plan uh, like about that. So how we will um, get back these people? Because uh, no, let's uh, uh, talk truthfully. If person, for example, who are teacher work in Ukrainian village and now they work in Vienna, Austria, uh, it's many perspectives to continue to work in Vienna, Austria or in Germany than in Ukrainian village. No, it's 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 true. It's life the level of uh, uh, level of economic growth, level of uh, social services, and so on and so forth. So how how to give to all these people motivator to get back and to start business in Ukraine and to develop territories and to develop villages? I didn't see um, this point in all these plans with numbers. Maybe you or your team saw this, uh, these points. Is it a question for me? You're absolutely right. That's a great, it, it is a uh, question to all, firstly to Mr. Landa and then to, yeah. to, to Pablo. To, so it's discussion, please. Yeah. Uh, it's a great problem. It, and uh, this problem was uh, even before uh, 2022. We lost, uh, we're losing uh, hundreds of thousands of people yearly, uh, not only by migration, but uh, with uh, national, uh, with um, natural decrease uh, and uh, now we have uh, a, a, a minus five to seven mi million people in uh, 2022 nobody knows the correct figure but uh, the last available data on uh, state statistics bureau is about 41 million uh, but uh, current estimate is about uh, 34 to 35 million uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we cannot expect uh, a lot of them will uh, come back before war ends or uh, at least hot uh, phase of this war ends. Uh, what we can offer uh, when we are, will uh, transfer to rebuild period. Uh, I, I hope that uh, with the help of international partners, we'll have a great plans of uh, reconstruction, which may uh, cause a, even deficit of workforce, if, even because even if we'll have enough money to do any reconstruction, uh, more than 90% of this uh, work should be done by Ukrainians. And to me, we uh, really may not have th such number of uh, professionals or uh, specialists in uh, Ukraine. So we'll uh, have to encourage them to come back. We'll have a positive um, uh, uh, case in uh, Georgia when uh, Mikhail Saakashvili became the president. He encouraged uh, uh, thousands of thousands of uh, young people which modern Western education to come back and rebuild uh, Georgia and uh, uh, that gave great results. And I hope uh, that uh, our uh, politicians uh, will have will do the same thing. Uh, we, we do not uh, uh, have a task to get back all these six million. Uh, we have to get the uh, best of them uh, to make this pro progress in a rebuild uh, process. Thank you for your perspective, Pablo, uh, your perspective to that. I think that uh, this situation is uh, consequences of uh, our government politic, uh, because uh, even before this uh, stage of war, more than 2 million Ukrainians uh, immigrated to Poland <clears throat> from uh, 2019 to 2022. And uh, this is consequences of this politics because uh, <clears throat> our uh, current government, our parliament, uh, this, uh, they created uh, such a horrible uh, uh, 
horrible conditions for business, for business doing that uh, almost uh, 200,000 uh, businesses closed. Understand? And when uh, uh, Zelensky came to power, there were 279,000 uh, enterprises. And now I receive a report from tax administration, only 80,000 enterprises now works. And uh, it means that uh, the real condition in which uh, uh, our business are, is working uh, is very poor because this uh, heavy administration of our uh, tax service uh, with blocking uh, business nobody can uh, can explain why they do this they explain that uh, they want uh, to cash schemes but uh, they blocked uh, white business just business uh, is blocked and the business uh, has to explain to tax administration that they are uh, they don't uh, do crime deals and uh, all business is under suspicion, and uh, we several times spoke to Pan Getmanov, who uh, do all this uh, blocking, and uh, he can't uh, explain why why he does this. And it is very. Getmanov uh, is head of uh, committee of business development. Committee and... of uh, tax and customs, yes. uh, and, uh, and our our ministry of finance who. Uh, is uh, who, who has uh, form uh, tax and custom politics. Uh, he completely uh, he is quiet and don't uh, and does not uh, explain why he rules this uh, process. And such situations that uh, business disappear, working places disappear. And, uh, and now we think, uh, how we will return our people back to Ukraine? It is impossible. Only after uh, overloading this uh, power, when uh, new people come to power, maybe they will create conditions where business can create working place. And uh, we, what, one more thing I want uh, to say is that uh, from 2019 to 2022, uh, no one dollar came to Ukraine as investment. It was not investment at all before war. And uh, the same people now are now have uh, power. And uh, what investment they will attract? I doubt uh, they will attract any dollar. Uh, so I think the only way overload this power and the new uh, politics uh, will came to power it will create conditions for development thank you thank you um i also um, wanna maybe some, some, somebody in uh, their uh, comments uh, in the end can also mention somebody uh, something about oligarchs because it's uh, it's big issue as corruption it's big issue uh, that uh, we have uh, monopolies um as some speakers mentioned, uh, Mr. Dligach mentioned about problem of monopolies. And uh, we have large part of government business, which also don't understandable for our foreign partners, what is government business, but why is this government business always on minuses? And what, why our privatization wasn't so effective in, in previous? And what we can do with oligarchs? So I sent to you also to chat news about uh, agency of uh, recovery. And uh, what do you think about this new agency? Because uh, Mr. Nayem will be have no now head of this agency and uh, yeah, like our, 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 our yeah so please please comment these two issues like monopolies oligarchs and oligarchs and uh, new agency is it uh, just uh, one more agency with the same function or it's good indicator um I have no information about this. Uh, I doubt. I doubt that uh, this new agency will create something new. 
because all these uh, people, uh, Mustafa Nayem, Milovanov, Gateman, we saw them uh, already for years. I don't know what what new they can uh, create. We we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, men who who every year on every, on different position in uh, government owned enterprise uh, or in some ministry infrastructure <laughs> or Ukrabaru Pro. Now he is in the agency of uh, rebuilding Ukraine. I don't know what yes, but 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 we but we must say directly so that he is not the from Zelensky team. So it's interesting because mostly position is people who was uh, uh, lead by people who uh, invited by Zelensky or his team and uh, uh, Mustafa Nayem not from Zelensky team. So it's uh, interesting uh, interesting point because otherwise uh, Zelensky have uh, no fully power in uh, um, all uh, sectors like in municipal power in uh, Verkhovna Rada in uh, Parliament's committee obviously in um, uh, secret services uh, attorney, uh, attorney general and so on and so forth and Mustafa Nayem from like different different political group if he wants so um i just ask him so it's uh, mm, it's, it's uh, yeah no it, it is political group from the past so uh, if, if uh, you know uh, the first uh, cabinet of minister was uh, chiefed by uh, gancharuk alexey mm -hmm. gancharuk it uh, no, they, these people, Gancharuk, Mustafa Nayem, Leshenka, all they from uh, Poroshenko team. But they appear on uh, political horizon uh, in uh, after Maidan. Mm -hmm. so, so all of them are from uh, Poroshenko time, from the past. And uh, how they appear in uh, uh, Zelensky team, I don't know, because uh, we don't know who created this uh, team. Uh, who who uh, hires these people? Maybe uh, in office presidents uh, there are some people who attract such type of team. Yeah, it's very interesting point because uh, not every people here in US understand that Ukraine is a huge country and to find people with good education and experience for all positions, even for governors, for war administrations, for every position in ministry, it's huge number of people. So it's hundreds of thousands of uh, government workers and government positions. And uh, it always was a big question where to find new people with new education for quite low salary. Um, and uh, and how, how how to move them from corruption? Because if person have five hundred dollar in public office, uh, we see on this uh, anti corruption work this week that uh, they uh, have money from somewhere to buy uh, Chanel, uh, Louis Vuitton, and other. Uh, goods and big houses and so on and so forth. So it's it's also big 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 question. So we must to change, but where to take people, and uh, that in every power it's unpopular to give to government ser servants good salary. Um, so it's 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 time of as as a discussion. But thank you for your position about these new organs. Um, so I think that we must to uh, finalize this discussion for now. So please give to us uh, your conclusions. Um, and uh, I understand that internet in Kiev not so stable. So also give maybe ideas for the next discussions. I think it's also must be discussions about sectoral economy policy, maybe about energy, about agriculture, about uh, infrastructure, uh, like this profil expert, or it must be more um, discussions about principles and and uh, uh, basic um, points uh, for the future, like value points. So please, your your final uh, remarks. Um, who wants, please, it's open. Uh, let me give a point about oligarchs. Yes, yes, Mr. Lander. Mm -hmm. Oligarchs, that's our topic. We, uh, uh, our one of main working forces uh, counting uh, net uh, worth of Ukrainian oligarchs. 
and uh, we will uh, decline uh, uh, their net worth uh, uh, time by time. And we'll do it uh, next time when uh, Global Forbes Edition will uh, make new billionaires list. Uh, I, I guess I, that okay. may change, but currently number of uh, Ukrainian billionaires will be reduced to uh, six. Uh, two of them uh, do not live in Ukraine for a long time. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, Grammarly shareholders. So, uh, only four bil classic billionaires uh, left by our evaluation. That's uh, Renat Akhmetov, uh, Renat Akhmetov, Konstantin Zhivago, Viktor Finchuk, and uh, Gennady Bogolyubov. Even um, Kalamoisky and Novinsky very, uh, and Poroshenko, uh, we estimate them uh, uh, less than one billion dollar about new institution. I, I Mr. Landa, can we... you also clarify for our Western audience what you mean on the word oligarch? Because not every person in DC understands it. Uh, yeah. That uh, word uh, comes from all ancient Greek, but uh, uh, became also popular in the 90s in uh, Ukraine and Russia, meaning uh, people who have uh, political power, uh, economical power, and uh, media. However, uh, a lot of these people lost... Uh, for example, they are media assets, but uh, are referred as oligarchs uh, as well by a, a certain uh, ling linguistic tradition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's important and it's important to mention that they so rich because they also taken part in privatization process. So, uh, because in other way, like uh, people on West ask, okay, Forbes, uh, said that Bezos also rich guy and he also have media and he also donates to campaign. What's the difference? So, and what's the problem with them? So uh, for, for Ukrainian audience, it's obvious, but uh, when you mention all these people, why they don't live in Ukraine, why they a problem, can you clarify a little bit about that and maybe methodology how you count their assets as Forbes? Uh... About fourth met methodology, we, we, we will not be in time, so I'll, I'll just leave it for another session. Okay. Uh, about uh, this participation in privatization, uh, you're right, uh, most of them are uh, took part. However, that was uh, a long time ago. We, we did not have a lot of big privatization um, uh, for last years. Uh, I remember just a few prioritizations in last uh, like 10 years. Uh, so mm, I don't think it will have uh, enough impact on the future. Uh, it is a fact that it was in uh, previous times. I, I don't I don't think we'll be back to reprioritization. Uh, however, there are some uh, risks that uh, th this may happen. Uh, but uh, the war is not time to to discuss about that uh, because uh, as we see U ukraine can um, uh, simply get assets of uh, uh, oligarchs such as kolomoisky uh, because uh, blaming him is in uh, uh, some bad things taking place uh, uh, years ago uh, how, uh, I believe that uh, if uh, the number of oligarchs is uh, reducing, that may, may reduce uh, their impact on Ukraine's uh, economy. Uh, they, they have uh, both positive and negative impact. And uh, uh, our goal, goal of Ukrainian society is uh, to reduce the negative impact. And uh, as we see during war, another negative impact, impact uh, as for me, uh, declined. I agree with uh, Vladimir that the uh, influence of oligarch uh, has uh, decreased. And uh, I think that the uh, president and his office now uh, have all power in, uh, in country and uh, he control all oligarchs. Thank you. Uh, if uh, somebody wanted to add more to our discussion, if no, I... Uh, propose to have uh, the next discussion about sectors um, and uh, also about uh, models of uh, 
economy restart, like not export resources, but recycle of uh, resources, I mean raw material, about trade, and uh, uh, of course um, about some specific I issues with the uh, sector of defense production and so on and so forth. Please feel free to propose, uh, or maybe uh, some specific time of oligarchs. Um, I uh, uh, also will share uh, our discussion with uh, decision-making persons here, I mean, uh, people who work on bills for Ukraine in um, House and Senate, uh, with think tanks, with analytics who work on Ukrainian issue. And um, uh, also, uh, we will hold one more discussion about related term, but I think it's also interesting in Russia disinformation campaign with media professionals. So how it works now and how we can find uh, fight with it in Ukraine, in Central Asia, in Europe and in the United States, because it's term which actual for now. Without that, we also can't um, talk about rebuilding and about additional money and about reforms in Ukraine. Thank you so much uh, for your positions. I also will share uh, this uh, video on a website of Institute for Democracy and Development and in social media, so you can reshare it to um, your audience. Um, Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you for your time and Slava Ukraine. Thank you.